Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this afternoon's virtual public open house presentation for the Intermountain Pump Storage Project. Located in Utah near the cities of Delta and Oak City and in close proximity to the existing Intermountain Generating Station. We appreciate everyone who has joined us today and it looks like we have a good representation from the community and various government agencies in the region. My name is Cynthia Viegas and I will be your moderator today. We will be doing some additional introductions in the slide deck today, but at this moment, I would like to introduce Premium Energy's Managing Director, Mr. Victor Rojas, who would like to say a few words. Hi, everyone. This is Victor Rojas. I'm the owner of PowerTech and Premium Energy Holdings. Several of my team members and I work on the Intermountain Power Plant Construction and Commissioning back in the 1980s, and we live in the Delta area for several years. We're very proud of the work that we did and the good relationship we built over the years. Today, you will hear from some of our team members, including Cynthia, Maria Hernandez, and John Dennis. Today, we will present this project to you and describe its main features and the work that we have been doing as part of the FERC process to license and develop this project. Most important, we want you all to know that this work is at the conceptual stage. And after introducing some basic project plans, we want to engage you, the local governance and the various agencies and all interested parties in the further development of this project. This project was conceived a few years back by the opportunity created by the decommissioning of the Intermountain Generating Station. We believe that the existing transmission infrastructure would be attractive to many new renewable energy projects. As renewable energy projects grew in number and size, eventually we felt the need that we could offer an energy storage to complement the economic and reliable operation of these projects. Based on our experience with pump storage in Los Angeles and other similar projects in the US, we thought that a pump storage plant would meet this energy storage need. The presence of the Seabird River plus the mountains adjacent to Oak City and the existing and future plant transmission infrastructure triggered the imagination of our engineers to come up with this plan, with this project. We believe our federal government has a keen interest in promoting the development of this type of energy project. The Department of Energy is conducting studies to reduce the cost and shorten the time for the development of new pump storage plants. Several renewable power generation projects are being proposed around the IPP areas, we all know. And also in neighboring states, such as in Nevada, Wyoming, California. With existing and future transmission lines, Miller County could become an energy hub with access to tens of thousands of megawatts of renewable generation coming from all directions. We offer an opportunity to these private developers and utilities to store the excess energy and reclaim it when it is the right time to produce it. The US will need many of these large energy storage projects that can store and release power over several days of duration. Other energy storage technologies such as hydrogen, batteries, etc., provides a good mix to diversify the service that makes the transition to 100% green power a successful reality. Thanks again for being with us today. We look forward to your input. Now, Cynthia is going to provide you with some basic guidelines for our open house today. Thank you. Cynthia, please. Thank you, Victor. In this first hour, next slide, please. In this first hour, we will we will present an overview and the preliminary studies of the project. In the second hour, we will answer any questions. Any questions not answered in the second hour will be later answered and posted for everyone's access. During today's presentation, all participants will be muted. We will save all questions for after the presentation. However, questions can be submitted at any time throughout the presentation through the Zoom platform using the Q&A button at the lower part of your screen or to this address, info at phllc.net. 
We will only be doing written questions for today. However, questions can be submitted through the Zoom platform using the Q&A button. Again, questions will be answered at the end of the moder at the end by the moderator and will be answered by the panelists when possible. Here are the ways that you can monitor the status of the project and contact us. And just a quick reminder to everyone to keep your mics muted during the presentation. Next slide, please. This is the agenda for our time together. We will share a brief overview of the FERC licensing process and then describe what a closed loop system is. Then we will provide a project overview and jump into some of the preliminary studies and some of the work that is being conducted right now, as well as plans for future work. And finally, we will move into the Q&A section. And with that, I will go ahead and turn this over to our first panelist, Maria Hernandez, our operations manager, to provide more information about the organizations involved developing and engineering this project. Okay, thank you, Cynthia. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you again for joining us. This pump storage project has been developed by Premium Energy Holdings. Premium Energy Holdings has been in operation since 2010 and is dedicated to the development of renewable energy projects, mainly solar and pump storage hydro. Premium Energy Holdings currently has five preliminary permits from the FERC and is in the process of securing three more preliminary permits. Power Tech Engineers is an engineering company that has been in operation since 1992. Many of their staff members are former LADWP engineers and professionals. Power Tech provides power engineering services to several uti utilities in Southern California, Florida, and throughout the United States. They have experience in generation, transmission, power distribution, substations, and generation, including solar, wind, hydro, and gas. WAPCOS is an engineering and development company that has been in operation since 1969 and belongs to the government of India. WAPCOS has extensive design and development experience in power projects, and they have a strong experience base in pump storage projects with 12 pump storage projects over the past 10 years. On the Zoom call today, we have several of our management and technical staff members joining us to hear the presentation and address any questions you may have. Included, Today, we have Victor Rojas, John Dennis, and Bruce Hamer from PowerTech. Victor and Bruce were involved in the design and site construction management of the Intermountain Power Plant in the early 1980s. So as you can see, our project members have some great bonds of this region. They know the community in interest in its continued well-being. Bruce Hamer was not only on the IPP site for its construction, but he was also involved in the engineering and construction of the Castaic Pump Storage Plant for the city of Los Angeles back in the 1970s. So we have an exceptionally good design team for this project. They know the area and they know the technology. With us today is also John Dennis from PowerTech, who has been building and managing large power projects for 38 years. John has extensive experience in hydroelectric and pump storage projects, as well as power system planning. On this next slide, highlights the Federal Energy and Regulatory Commission's licensing process for projects such as the Intermountain Pump Storage Project. Under the Federal Power Act, FERC has permitting and licensing jurisdiction over hydroelectric projects such as this project. We are currently in the preliminary permit stage, which is conceptual engineering. FERC preliminary permit does not authorize construction during this phase. The preliminary permit allows the developer to analyze the site and engage stakeholders for feasibility of the project. During this phase, the applicant files periodic status reports on the studies that will be performed. The preliminary permit can lead to licensing of the project. There are several processes that FERC allows to obtain the license. Premium Energy Holdings will be following the integrating licensing process, the ILP, which provides a predictable, efficient, and timely licensing process to ensure adequate protections of resources. 
In brief, the ILP allows for the early identification of any major issues and identifies the studies that are needed for the project. It recognizes the various project stakeholders and interested parties and integrates the various permitting processes. The ILP also sets timeframes for each step. This keeps the developer, stakeholders, and FERC all working together in a timely fashion. This open house is part of the ILP process to provide an overview of the project and identify the stakeholders and their various interests. A little later in our presentation, we will share the project timeline and a few more parts and pieces of the licensing process. Now, John Dennis will be providing the project overview. Next slide, please. Thank you, Maria. Pump storage is a method to store energy by pumping water from a lower reservoir to an upper reservoir. And then when energy is needed to supply the power grid, the stored water will flow from the upper reservoir down to the lower reservoir and generate power. So when there's available renewable energy, we pump water. And when there's a need for energy on the grid, water will discharge from the upper reservoir and generate power. This would be much like charging and discharging a battery, but it's all done with clean water. Our plan would be to pump water using excess renewable energy such as solar and wind power. An open loop system takes water from a nearby river or a large body of water and pumps it to an upper reservoir. Then water is released from the upper reservoir, generating power and the water returns to the river or large body of water. This would be an open loop system. A closed loop pump storage system recycles water between the upper and lower reservoirs. In this case, we will try to maintain separation from the severe river so that it will work as a closed loop pump storage system. Intermountain pump storage project is a closed loop system, meaning that we will take some water from the Severe River for the initial reservoir fillings. Clearly, we'll need to work through all of the local water agencies, some are represented at the meeting today, uh, for this water, and perhaps we can find some mutually beneficial uses, such as more water storage. Once filled, we would no longer be connected to the Severe River for cycling of water. This body of water is in a closed loop system, continually moving up and down from the lower reservoir to the upper reservoir, up for pumping and down for generation. This is ideal in maximizing the use of clean renewable energy, especially when power is needed at night. Next slide, please. Now a little bit more about the specifics of the Intermountain Pump Storage Project. Premium Energy Holdings submitted an application for a preliminary permit from FERC. And we received approval for the permit from FERC on December 18, 2019. The project has a unique identifying number of 14993-000. So if you would do a Google search of the words FERC license and this number 14993-00, you should be able to quickly find information about the Intermountain Pump Storage Project and its current status or you can see it on our website as was noted at the beginning of the presentation. The project is rated for 12 hours of continuous operation that could produce 24,000 megawatt hours, which is 12 hours of 2000 megawatts of operation and with some backup for as much as 24 hours. As previously mentioned, the existing operation is a closed loop and water is cycled between the upper and lower reservoirs. The 2000 megawatt power plant consists of four turbines of 500 megawatts for generation and one additional turbine of 500 megawatts used for pumping. In this diagram, you can see one of the possible alternatives for the lower and upper reservoirs. As mentioned before, the lower reservoir is separated from the Severe River. Water will be pumped through the powerhouse to the pressure tunnel and then pumped uphill to the upper reservoir. For your reference, some approximate elevations are shown on the left side of the graph and distances are shown on the bottom of the graph. And now Victor Rojas is gonna share some key features of the project. Hi, Victor, please unmute. Hi, this is Victor Rojas. Uh, some of the main features of the Intermountain Pump Storage Plan includes, as you well know, 
uh, supports to retire the fossil fuel plants and complements the operation of renewable projects replacing those plants. The project consumes less, much less water from the Sibir River than any other power plant project. It's basically just evaporation losses. It also provides additional water storage for local farming with uh, one of the recommendations one of the alternatives of the lower reservoirs uh, provides a, a much larger uh, reservoir that could be used for assist the local farming. The project also will help the economy with jobs during and after construction. It's a non-polluting power project. It a, has a low carbon footprint as compared with other energy storage technologies such as battery. It uses mainly the excess generation of renewables during the day to make up for the losses of renewables at night when the sun is not shining and the wind is not blowing. And the proposed project would utilize some of the intermountain power plant transmission facilities, such as the AC yard, to interconnect to the power grids of Utah through the Mona Lines and through Wyoming, Nevada, and others through the existing AC and DC uh, plan, also transmission lines such as the TransWest uh, transmission project. Next slide, please. As you all know, renewable power is not dispatchable. Power to the grid can be ready to flow with our project in a very short notice or open demand not just when the sun is shining or the wind is blowing. Improves the economic dispatch of renewable generation. Producers don't have to price their excess energy at negative prices. They can store it and sell it when the price is right and the demand is right. Also, sometimes wind or solar power is described as variable, intermittent or semi-volatile. For example, when there are too many clouds covering a solar farm, when the wind start, stops blowing or when the wind is gusting, the power output of these generation resources can swing up and down. Pump storage can regulate those unstable outputs on a large scale and thereby meet the full power needs of the end users. It could also assist on the black star or re-energy session of the grid after a major system blackout. Facilitates frequency regulation of the grid. In sum, the pump storage project improves the overall energy mix. Now, John Dennis is going to show us the proposed project timeline. Thank you, Victor. This slide is a high level view of the project timeline. As mentioned earlier, the preliminary application was submitted to FERC in 2019. In 2020, we've been working on the pre application document, or it's also called the PAD and the Notice of Intent, which has been submitted to FERC. And those documents are available to you also through our webpage. We're conducting these open house meetings to communicate the progress of the project. But we'll continue doing feasibility work and holding more meetings with you, the community, the local governance and stakeholders who are interested in the progress and the development of the project. We'll develop a more detailed study plan and consult with any agencies or Native American groups that could be affected by this power project. We'll also be conducting feasibility studies and file the FERC license application for construction. We expect to finish this step by 2022. In 2022, once we file the FERC application, we'll be conducting all the environmental work up to 2024. And there's no doubt, certainly interconnection agreements, water and utility agreements, power purchase agreements, all these will need to be developed, negotiated, and approved during this time frame. Once the environmental work is approved and we get a license from FERC, we can move into the project detailed engineering. In 2024, we plan to be doing the design, construction drawings, and preparing the bid engineering specifications for engineering, procurement, and construction. Once the project engineering is completed, materials will start arriving on site and construction will start. We expect construction to be completed by 2027. 
We'll start commissioning units as they get completed and we expect full commissioning to be complete by the end of 2028 and the plant will be placed in commercial operation. Next slide. Here are some project area maps. The project is located in central Utah in the northeast part of Millard County. The closest cities and towns are Delta City, Oak City, Lemington, and Lindell. Also, we can find the DMAD Reservoir in the Sevier River. On this map, we're also showing three lower reservoir alternatives. And again, these are alternatives for lower reservoirs. One is the proposed DMAD 2 Reservoir. The other is a proposed Oak Reservoir. And the third is a proposed sink reservoir. And then off to the east, we also show three alternatives for the proposed upper reservoirs, including the Dry Fork, the Mill Canyon, and Williams Reservoir. Again, these are alternatives that are being considered in this study. Next slide. Here in the slide, we're presenting three alternative lower reservoirs with some of the characteristics on the right side of the slide. The first one could be like the existing DMAD reservoir with an estimated area of 30,000 acres, an estimated water storage of 49,000 acre feet and a 4,700 foot maximum elevation. It's possible even as we work through the negotiations and local discussions, this configuration to be an open loop system. That is a possibility as we discuss that more. We have found other options located near wetlands with natural terrain that could be suitable for building reservoirs. One of these options is the sink reservoir with an approximate water storage of 41,000 acre feet. And the other one is the Oak Creek Reservoir with 38,000 acre feet approximate storage. We've estimated the preliminary shapes of the reservoirs, but the shorelines may look a little different than what we have shown here. These are just some approximations. We have three proposed alternatives for the upper reservoirs, the Dry Fork Reservoir, the Mill Canyon Reservoir, and the Williams Reservoir. The reservoir with the largest storage capacity is the Dry Fork with almost 40,000 acre feet, and then the Mill Canyon with 30,000 acre feet, and Williams with 28,000 acre feet. Next slide. And these preliminary study outcomes, we'll be talking about the preliminary studies that we have conducted, and we're going to briefly present the outcomes of these preliminary studies. The details of these findings are found in the pre-application document, as we noted, uh, also called the PAD. In the environmental aspects, the civil elements of geology and soil are important to know the type of the terrain in the project sites and the soil conditions especially because of the sizable amount of tunneling that's required on this project and certainly building some strong uh, foundations for the major equipment. We also looked at the important water resources, some of which has been detailed in the pre-application document to FERC. We've looked at the fish and the aquatic resources in the Severe River and detailed investigations of the wildlife and botanical resources of the area, including where the lower and upper reservoirs have been proposed. The studies have been done in the floodplains, wetlands, and the river areas, and the lower reservoirs examining the riparian and the littoral, or those are the shoreline habitat impacts. And finally, we identified species that are rare, threatened, or endangered. Maria is going to cover this next section on the environmental concerns. Thank you, John. So this slide, um, you know, the preliminary studies indicate that this is the type of terrain and rock that we have throughout the project site. There is no major risk known from earthquakes. The known faults are about five miles east of the project and will not compromise the upper reservoir dam. Our studies also show that there will be challenges with the soil and rock as well as slow stability. And this too will be addressed during the project design. Geological and soil studies will be critical for good foundations and the sizable construction activities, which include tunneling. The blue lines show the proposed tunnel routes through the various rock. We plan to tunnel through seven to eight miles between the upper and lower reservoirs. Our next slide 
The preliminary studies indicate that the primary uses of the Sevier River is for agricultural use, some domestic use, and also for the operation of the IPP power plant. The Lemington Canal connects with the Sevier River, providing water to Lemington Town. Companies that have ownership of the water system in this area includes the Lemington Irrigation Company, Melvin Irrigation Company, and Central Utah Water Company. The DMAD Reservoir has light fishing, and the various seasons may affect the quantity of some fish species. The entrainment of large fish at the new reservoirs will be very minimal. There will be structures designed to protect the fish, like intake structures, trash racks, and other techniques to reduce the impact of the intake on the fish. Cynthia will cover the next section. Floodplains, wetlands, riparian, and littoral habitat impacts. Filling the lower reservoir will cover some of the vegetation in the area. Remedial actions will be taken to minimize the impacts from the construction of the lower reservoir. We will work with the U.S. Forest Service to complete the studies on wildlife to minimize and mitigate any possible impacts on wildlife and botanical resources. And finally, we are looking into the impact of the project on rare, threatened, and endangered species. The proposed upper reservoir would be in the Canyon Mountain Range next to Oak City and some of these reservoirs may affect some bald eagles or the northern goshawk that nests in that area. We're going to be studying how to avoid impacting those two bird species and studies will be performed to detail the potential conflict at the Fish Lake National Forest. Mitigation strategies will be developed to minimize the impacts of the project which would be implemented during the preparation of the licensing application. Next slide, please. Next, we will look at the preliminary findings of the cultural, social, and economic aspects of the project. The preliminary studies indicate the following. For recreation and land use, an assessment will be necessary for the areas within the project boundaries and areas adjacent to the project boundary. For socioeconomic matters, preliminary studies indicate that the project will be, bring a surge of local economic benefits associated with the wages and incomes of the project workforce, followed with long-term benefits of, the additional, of additional operations and maintenance workforce jobs. The Intermountain Pump Storage Project development would result in an increase in overall countywide sales. Many parts of the project will be underground, but aesthetics and appearances will be addressed for minimal impact. No known cultural resource will be impacted by the project, but those items may become clearer as we open the project to the community and perform our detailed site inspections. There are no known tribes or Native American groups affected by the project. Next, we'll have John Dennis going on going over ongoing efforts. Thank you. A flood management plan will be developed for the upper reservoir alternatives. Uh, let me see here, I'm sorry about that. Let me skip back. Uh, as we move on with the conceptual stage of the project, the following are some of the upcoming efforts or the studies that are going to be happening. And so slide 22, yeah. The flood management plan will be developed for the upper reservoir alternatives. We've identified the natural streams and creeks that would serve as drainage routes to control a possible flooding risk and to control the water level in the dam. These routes are shown in the red lines on this map. For the Dry Fork Reservoir alternative, water would be discharged through Dry Creek and Full Creek. On the Mill Canyon Reservoir alternative, water would discharge through the Full Creek. And on the Williams Reservoir alternative, water would discharge through the Dry Creek and Oak Creek. And finally, the water would make its way out to the area formerly known as the Central Utah Canal and disperse. Next slide. We've identified potential site sites in the state-owned land near the lower reservoir that could work as the main construction and lay down camp. This could be accessed from Highway 132 North or Highway 6 South and other local existing roads. We're also considering the use of the railroad for hauling large equipment. Of course, improvement of some of the roads will be necessary to support the weight of the heavier equipment and handle the increased construction transportation activities. 
The proposed secondary construction camp is currently located in privately owned land. Again, this is just proposed, uh, just for this conceptual approach. This still needs to be analyzed and ultimately worked out with local landowners. Victor Rojas will share some information on the possible transmission interconnections. Hi. Um, as far as transmission interconnection goes, uh, the green line represents the proposed 345 kV AC tie line for the project that runs from the proposed powerhouse for the intermountain pump storage to the intermountain AC switcher and uh, following the Brush Wellman Road. The line shown in yellow and orange belongs to the, fuse, the future transmission project by TransWest that we have considered in the, uh, in the economic analysis of this project. Uh, the other lines shown are existing, the Mona lines um, that connects IPP to Utah. And of course, the, the DC line going to Adelanto. Uh, so this is a conceptual sketch of the transmission system surrounding the uh, power plant. Next slide, please. In this slide, we'd like to give you an idea of, of how we conceive the pumping operation for the plant will work. Okay. Um, we have sketched the major transmission projects that are involved, including the future transmission lines from TransWest. And uh, we're considering power opportunity for storage coming from the existing solar project developers that are in queue for interconnection to the AC switcher. We got 2000 megawatts of solar projects that are, that could be a, they could find a good fit for storage in our intermountain pumping plant. We also have opportunities for storage coming from the Wyoming project. And the Wyoming project could also use our project for storage for their access. There could be also opportunities for renewable projects throughout Utah, Wyoming, and Montana, other areas to the east of the project that could come through the Mona substation, could reach our pump storage. And finally, we can also receive uh, or offer services to the renewal projects down in the southern tip of Nevada, uh, where we have a, a huge market of uh, renewal projects. They could also consider our pump storage as a place to store their excess energy. So you can see there is a lot of opportunities for uh, usage of our pump storage. Now we're going to consider the generation mode. In the generation mode, of course, we're going to be discharging power. Uh, and uh, again, we can serve Utah through the Mona substation and Idaho and any other place where the clients want their power to be dispatched. Of course, the clients will have to make their own transmission agreements. We can also serve the Southern California municipalities through Adelanto if there is any interest from the uh, municipalities. And we can also serve uh, the big Kaiso Nevada market uh, if we tap onto the capacity, available transmission capacity of the uh, TransWest line to Southern Nevada. So as you can see, we have access to a big market of a power load that our project could uh, serve. Now, I would like to have Mr. John Dennis talk about the cost, the levelized cost of storage for our project. 
Thank you, Victor. Uh, on this slide, it's a bit of an eye chart, but let me just go through the details from the top to the bottom. We'll briefly show you our levelized cost of storage analysis for this project. The levelized cost of storage is a financial economic analysis that establishes the cost we should charge to store energy produced by others. Basically, we're just a large warehouse that offers energy storage service. It could be for anybody in the local region or throughout California or Nevada, uh, Wyoming, but to offer this energy storage service. And we offer this service to anyone, utilities, independent power producers interested in storing their energy to claim it back later. This study also allows us to compare the cost of our project service against other storage technologies, including other pump storage projects. We're, we are at a conceptual stage of the project, so our numbers could change, but we're working on the presumption of certain project features that could change as a project is further developed during its feasibility phase. At the engineering stage of our project, we're still using a high level cost estimate. However, we've designed a financial model that has allowed us to estimate very competitive prices. We believe our costs are competitive against battery storage, especially for extended periods such as eight, 12 and 24 hour durations. The overall life of the pump storage plant far surpasses the life of batteries. A pump storage plant could last even 100 years as demonstrated by so many hydro plants in the world. Pump storage is efficient, reliable, economic, and it is a well-proven technology. As we can see in the chart from our economic study, we present two pricing structures. The first pricing structure is for the event the business structure is a build, operate, transfer, BOT, for the storing of energy from the future owner. This business structure could be attractive to utility or a very large independent power producer. Depending on the final payment for the transfer to the new owner, the cost of service per megawatt hour starts from as low as $11 per megawatt hour if we consider a project life of 50 years. And as we said before, these hydro plants could operate for a century. We believe this project is a good fit for utilities such as Southern California Public Power Authority or Pacific Core and many other energy providers in the West. In our model, we've used 25, 40, and 50 years. If we transfer ownership of the plant after 25 years, we could offer a price in the range of $35 to $45 per megawatt hour. And if we transfer ownership after 40 years, this price range could drop to $20 to $40 megawatt dollars per megawatt hour. And if we transfer ownership after 50 years, the price we can offer could reach the range of 11 to $18 per megawatt hour. On the lower portion of the slide, the bar graphs on this diagram show an apples to apples comparison of storage costs for pump storage and battery storage without the build operate transfer financing. These charts are provided from some recent independent studies out of UCSD that was released on May 21st, 2019. The key author there is David Victor and others. Uh, comparing pump storage and battery storage costs, the levelized cost of storage with 40 years of the useful life of the pump storage plant provides an LCOS of $186 per megawatt hour. And in the case of 50 years of the useful life of the plant, the levelized cost of storage reaches $177 per megawatt hour. And in the case of the batteries on the two charts off, to, the bar charts off to the right, the cost of storage reaches $204 with a useful life of 20 years and $218 with a useful life of 40 years. In all the cases, the pump storage cost of service of storage is more competitive. In the case of our project, the Intermountain Pump Storage Project, the price range uh, for our project is shown in these bubbles that are drawn there is within the competitive parameters of the study when we do a clear apples to apples comparison of costs without the clouding of any build operate transfer financing. As you can see under the BOT model, the cost of, or the final transfer arrangements can be a, make a big difference in the energy pricing structures. And again, we don't wanna discount the BOT options in there. They have some great uh, alternatives, incentives and such uh, tax benefits and such that are important in those arrangements. But we wanted to provide uh, for our audience today just a comparative cost apples to apples uh, for the prices for energy storage projects that vary greatly depending on the terms and there are many incentives and tax benefits that can be achieved. However, similar to a car lease, 
the monthly lease may be low, but there was a large down payment or a large payout made at the end of the lease. So those are things we just wanna make sure our audience is aware of. The bottom line is that we believe that pump storage can be demonstrated to be cost competitive and can have an extremely long life. Next slide. In order to complete the project or to develop a complete project, we've identified the following necessary studies, including geotechnical studies and water quality studies. Regarding the environmental aspects, we'll be working on species and habitat analysis, as well as a potential visual impact on the surroundings and the cultural resources. As we work with the local agencies and the various interest groups, there may be additional studies that will be important for the project viability. So this concludes our presentation and Cynthia will be moderating our question and answer session next. Thank you, John. Um... I just wanted to thank all our panelists for their insight on the Intermountain Pump Storage Project that has been proposed by Premium Energy Holdings. And I just wanted to remind all the attendees today and anyone who has just joined us that you can submit your questions down below. If you move your cursor to the bottom of the screen, a Q&A tab should pop up and you can go ahead and submit any questions there. Uh, that would be best for us to be able to record all questions. Um, but before we go to the Q&A section, we have a few final words from our Managing Director, Victor Rojas. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'd like to thank you for attending this open house today. Our intentions are sincere in providing the Miller County with another power project that will, be, will benefit the environment and provide great job opportunities for the community. We're driven by the interest to complement the great energy hub business development that is starting to spring up in your area. I believe we can work together with other projects providing renewable energy and storage services. There is work for everyone. We also feel part of this community. We live there during the construction of the Intermountain Power Project. We have our kids there in the project. And I spend most of my life personally at LA Water and Power overseeing the operation and the maintenance of this power plant. So we feel an affinity with this place. Also Premium Energy Holdings wants our audience to know that as we move through the development of this project, we will always include you, the community, in our decision-making process for the design of this project. And we'll always be looking for all possible ways to benefit the community. This project is mainly driven with the desire to connect and to cooperate with the energy transformation that is going on right now in our country and with utilities in the West. We would also like to connect with large renewable power developers, such as the wind project in Wyoming. This could be an excellent feat for the project operation. This project is your project, the project of the community, the project of the developers. Let's work together on making this a reality. I thank you again for joining us to, in this open house. And we look forward to future meetings to work together as we develop this project. Thank you very much. Thank you, Victor. Um, we haven't received any questions. We're going to take a few moments to allow you to go ahead and go to the Q&A tab and submit any questions you have. Um, I'll give a, a minute or two for that. Uh, Maria, I, I saw one that came from Eduardo Salgado. Yes. Uh, with regards to a 100 megawatt uh, reference plant. Yes, we have that in the and queue. Okay, let me just uh, share uh, real quickly about that, if I could. Um, there are uh, several large 100 megawatt storage plants that are being sprinkled around the West Coast area that are being proposed. Uh, they're working on some pricing, some construction. We know of some of those in the uh, South uh, Southern California area. Uh, these have some particular niche. They, they meet some local regulation uh, interests. Um, but again, we don't want to disparage those. We think that uh, 
all these energy storage projects have some unique applications and capabilities. Uh, but what we'd like to say is that while there's a 100 megawatt plant that has perhaps four or maybe 10 or 12 hours of operation, that might have energy storage for maybe 1,000 megawatt hours or 1,200 megawatt hours of storage. But uh, if we're going to increase the renewable energy resources above the 50, 60, 70 percent, we're going to need larger storage than that. And so it's very, very important as we look at this, um, there's a uniqueness of the batteries. Uh, the concern is that after perhaps 10 or 12 years, you have to replace the batteries uh, and there still are some uh, lithium ions, some chemicals that need to be dealt with. Uh, we see also the advantages of the pump storage being a clean resource and largely uh, where we see that uh, fitting into the mix is that you have some large scale uh, energy storage, not just uh, 1,000 megawatt hours, but we're talking in the range of 12,000, 24,000 megawatt hours of energy storage. So this could meet some large needs in the West, in the Western grid, uh, as we increase renewable energy. And the, I gotta tell you, as far as my experience with pump storage and seeing an energy planning, I appreciate the pump storage even more because it's basically, it's concrete, and steel and water and some really smart people that operate the facilities and, and run them. Uh, and you've got a really good mix uh, that happens. And then there's some mutual benefits that occur in the community with uh, reservoirs that are built. So anyway, that's a, a summary or quick note, but if we uh, Eduardo, if we have some specific articles that we can point you to with regards to the uh, BOT information for a 100 megawatt plant, we'll send that to you as a follow-up. Thank you, John, for that. Um, so we did receive a question and I'm going to read it and here we go. Will the maps and other slides be available that we could distribute to our local biologists for comment? Uh, the answer is absolutely yes. Uh, we want you to use this as a resource. Um, we want you to know, uh, especially for the community, those people that are interested in the project and the impacts it might have, uh, that is the purpose of the ILP or the integrated licensing process. It's so we can identify any key issues early on, uh, communicate with you. Unfortunately, most of these times we would do these open houses right there with you and right in the community, but this is COVID related stuff. And so we're, uh, we're remote. Uh, but uh, we would like to have the community participate in that. So go to the Premium Energy uh, website and uh, that's listed here and get the maps and the information that we've shared. Also the uh, PAD and the NOI, the uh, pre-application document and the notice of intent has information that's pertinent as well. That'll be helpful to you. So with that, when we identify those major concerns, it may identify then additional studies that are necessary as we move towards the licensing process. Thank you, John. Uh, any other questions? While we're waiting uh, just a moment, I would just say is that we noticed from the, uh, the list of the participants, we have a lot of uh, local, uh, agencies, water companies. Uh, we have several of the districts that are represented. We have some of the natural resource uh, agencies that are represented there as well. And uh, we'll be reaching out to you as we look at the um, integration of any permitting process as it would tie into this particular project. Again, that's part of the ILP and the outreach efforts that are there. We just wanna make sure that people understand as we filed the preliminary permit, what's really, really important here is that the preliminary permit just gives premium energy an opportunity for a period of time to study the area and look at the impacts. And we wanna be very careful about the feeling of presumption here. Uh, we wanna work with the community as Victor has said, uh, to identify concerns and then get them addressed in these early studies. And so our, our hope is that we can build the relationships that are necessary there for a, a promising and effective project. 
Thank you, John. Uh, I just wanted to remind everyone that today's uh, presentation is being recorded and it will be uploaded on Premium's website, premiumenergyholdings.com. And uh, we'll give a few more moments for any more questions. Also, if questions come up later on, you can go ahead and email them to info at pehllc.net. Um, and we'll be happy to answer them and also post them for others to be able to, to have access to. Well, that is all the time we have for today. We will post answers to any remaining questions that we uh, receive through email at info at phllc.net um, on our website. Thank you all for attending and we are open to any feedback and would like to hear from everyone. With that, we'll clo now close the meeting and please be safe out there and take care. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.